He hit me. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the January 19th, 2021 Pulse Falls City Council meeting. Shannon will note that all council members are present with councillors uh, Wolf and Borders in chambers, councillors Malloy, Council President Wilhelm, Councillor Thorson, and Councillor Anthony joining us via Zoom. Under ceremonies, announcements, uh, appointments, and presentations, do you want to do the City Link first? Is that, is that, or do you want to do this one first? Okay, let's do this one first since you're here. Yeah, the property tax one. <laughs> we, it's not on the agenda, but we've got a, a short video, and it's basically an informational video on tax calculation, how it affects how our taxes are calculated. Uh, Shelly, Stephanie, et cetera, have done a good job in make, keeping it very simple. And there will be uh, probably additional videos coming out to address some of the questions that are asked. But uh, this three and a half minute video, so uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Meet the Post family. They live in Post Falls, Idaho. They're homeowners, and each June they receive a property assessment notice from Kootenai County, along with all other property owners in Post Falls. In December, they also receive a property tax payment notice from Kootenai County. The property taxes on the Post's property tax notice reflects a portion of each local taxing district's budget and is based on the assessed value set by the Kootenai County Assessor's Office. Let's assume three houses each have an assessed value of $100,000 and the combined budgets of all of the local taxing districts is $900. To calculate each property's tax rate, the $900 total combined budget is divided by the combined assessed value of all three properties, equaling $0.003. That means each property owner would pay .003 times the $100,000 assessed value of their property or $300. Each property pays their share of taxes based on their assessment value. <clears throat> this looks simple, but let's see what happens the following year when assessed values change but the total combined taxing district's budget stays the same at $900. House number one is now assessed $150,000, house number two at $100,000, and house number three at $70,000. House number one's assessed value increased by 50%, House number two's value stayed the same, and house number three decreased by 30%. In this scenario, the overall average assessment value increased to $106,667, or 6.67%. Because of this change, a new tax rate must be calculated. $900 divided by the combined assessed value of all three properties, equaling $0.00281250. That means in year two, house one will pay $421.88 in taxes. House two will pay $281.25 and house three will pay $196.87. The county still collects the same $900 needed for the taxing district's budgets, but house one now will pay $121.88 more. House two will pay $18.75 less and House 3 will pay $103.13 less in taxes than compared to Year 1. As you can see, how your taxes change each year depends on how your property assessment changes in comparison to the average assessment changes in the taxing district. Here, the average assessment increased by 6.67% in Year 2. Because the assessments for Houses 2 and 3 were less than the average, they had a tax decrease, even though the total amount of tax dollars collected stayed the same. House 1, with a 50% increase in assessment value, had a significant increase in taxes. In the real world, the assessed value of your home is compared not just to other residential property, but to the assessed value of all property types, including commercial and manufacturing. If residential values increase faster than commercial values, the residential owners will pay more in taxes even when the taxing district budgets are not increased. 
just like Property One. On behalf of the City of Post Falls, thank you for taking the time to gain insight into how our local taxes work. Thank you, and again, very well done, very, very nice. easy yeah. to understand, and I think it kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, people's taxes go up, and they think the city has increased their taxes, when in fact it's, it's as we've talked about, a tax shift. Uh, residential property values are going up significantly faster than commercial, which moves uh, commercial property values, which then moves more of the tax burden onto the residences. And that's one of the things we're looking at following closely in this year's legislature, uh, with all these different ideas coming up on tax bills, et cetera, uh, our concern is that uh, they look at the real cause of this and uh, you know make sure that any legislation they pass addresses the issue, because they could put a they could actually create a tax freeze and your taxes could still go up. Uh -huh. So anyway, it's, again, Shelley staff, thanks. Well done. Joe Thank has you. a question. Yes. Joe has a question. comment. One thing I think it's important to note in that presentation also just for people to know is that the way the city collects taxes is not we didn't make that up that's all state law that says we have to collect it this way um so it's, it's not what so we didn't come up with that so it's, any objections you may have as a citizen to how they're collected um please contact your your local state legislators and let them know that it ought to be different thanks joe all right okay uh, carrie go ahead yeah, and it's the county that is doing the assessed values. True. The and and that is mentioned in the video. The video talks about is the county's assessor's office that does those values. Yep. Yeah. Okay. With that, next item on the agenda. Uh, folks on Zoom, I'm looking at you, but if I miss you, and Carrie, I almost missed your hand that time. So if I do miss, please... Uh, uh, let me know so I don't skip over you. Next item up is a uh, short presentation from CityLink on public transportation. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Can. Yep. Name for the record, Great. please. Uh, my name is Tim Hibbard. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, I am working as the VP of Innovation of Development and Tech uh, for Pasio Technologies. We are the technology partners for CityLink North, Cooney Health, and Coeur d'Alene's Tribe Link Service. The history behind this project is that in 2019, Cooney County submitted a proposal to the Federal Transportation Transit Administration and won a competitive bid for an integrated mobility, mobility innovation project. My goals today are to describe how a fully integrated transportation network can better serve your citizens' needs and to give a project updated project update and expe expe expected timeline for next steps. Planning a trip in a non-integrated environment is tricky. Each provider presents their schedule and rates slightly differently, so comparing transportation options isn't always apples to apples. If your trip happens to be longer or outside of first shift hours and therefore needs to combine multiple providers, that becomes very complicated to book. You would need to use multiple reservation apps and be sure to time the transfer between providers correctly. These complications result in rider frustration and underutilization of transportation options. This means missed work, missed interviews, and missed medical appointments. Lack of transportation costs the United States healthcare system approximately $1 billion each year because of missed appointments. Mobility as a service takes all the different data sources and multiple payment channels and packages it into a single rider facing solution. The rider enters their trip information and mobility requirements like wheelchair or service animal and the app is able to look at all the providers and present a list of options to complete the trip. Each rider will have personal preferences in their trip selection process like cost, time waiting or walking distance. The rider can sort the options based on the parameters that are most important to them. To build the network, transportation providers will input their service area and hours into a single database. The transportation providers are motivated to use a network because they will see an increase in riders and will be able to make data-driven business decisions based on transportation demand information for the entire region. Riders will be able to download the app from Google Play or the Apple App Store. 
or if they prefer, they can use a web browser on their computer. For individuals that are unable to use a smartphone or a computer, they will be able to call in a CityLink dispatch to book a ride. We also support mobility managers. So if a workforce development center wanted to book rides for employment transportation, they could do that through the app or a reservation nurse could help a patient secure transportation when booking a medical appointment. Our apps will be fully accessible and easy to use. We have finished defining the open data standard that we will use to communicate between systems. It was important for us to pick a standard that is open so third parties can easily access information in a known format. We are currently building the portal that transportation providers will use to input their service areas and building the app that riders will use to book trips. We expect this to be done by fall. Then we will enable the system to receive payments from riders and distribute those funds to the transportation provider. We expect that to be done by next spring. After that, the county will continue to grow the network to enhance the coverage across the region. My contact and Chad's contact information is on this slide if anyone would like to reach out for more details. Thank you for this opportunity and I will take any questions at this time. Thank you, Tim. Any questions of Tim? I just have oh, one. I got one. Uh, Al first. On. Uh, hang on just a minute, Steve. Al first. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned transportation providers. Could you give us an idea of what we're talking about in Kootenai County in terms of, I mean, I. When you said that, it was like, well, who does transportation providing besides, say, a taxi service and CityLink? Who are we talking about? Um, so, yes, yeah, CityLink, but also Whitetail Transportation. Um, and then we will be able to plug into transportation or taxi services, like you're saying, as well as other um, non emergency medical transportation providers in the area. And if Chad or Jody are on the line, they can probably speak uh, more intelligently about your exact region. Yeah, uh, this is this is Chad. And uh, just wanted to let you know, we're also looking into not just uh, vehicle transportation, but also bike paths and walking paths and those things of that nature as well, so that we can tie into all transportation. Um, non-motorized and motorized. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Steve, Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. I know right now you mentioned medical appointments and the cost to the uh, medical community. I believe Kootenai Health now provides probably 90% of the transportation to the hospital and appointments. And that is a free service which people can call into. So when you mentioned charging, how does Kootenai Health fit into this picture? The Kootenai Health uh, Transportation Department. Yes, so we, we still partner with Kootenai Health for that transportation and for services that are not looking to provide a fare, it'll still be free and we'll just be the platform for the booking. Um, so they can we can help them out in order to um, give people all the information that they need because they they will provide transportation for those appointments that are in the Kootenai Health Network only, but we're going to provide that platform so that they can still provide those rides just in an easier fashion and then um, hook them to you know, things like white tail and, and get them a first mile, last mile type of thing where there's areas that Kootenai Health doesn't go to, then we'll be able to provide a ride into areas where then Kootenai Health could pick them up, take them the rest of the way in situations like that. So you are working with the Kootenai Health Transportation Department this time. They're, get, they're uh, providing you input on how their organization works right now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the agenda tonight? There are none tonight, sir. Any declarations of conflict or ex parte contacts or site visits? Seeing none, would you please present the consent calendar? Item A is minutes from the January 5th. 2021 City Council meeting. Item B is payables December 29th, 2020 through January 11th, 2021. 
Item C is request to surplus gym equipment by the police department. Item D is west side at Prairie Falls subdivision plat application. And item E is west side <coughs> at Prairie Falls subdivision construction improvement agreement addendum. Any questions on the consent calendar? Not to entertain a motion. I'd move to accept mm -hmm. the uh, consent calendar as presented. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. We do have one public hearing tonight, and it's the Livingston annexation. And uh, Mr. Manley, that I will open the public hearing. Sorry, I'm getting my screen share going. Shannon, anyone wishing to speak? And you've got that information? Thank you. Okay, can you guys all see that? Yep. 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 Yes. All right, good evening, Mayor Jacobson and Council President Wilhelm and other members of City Council. John Manley, Planning Manager, City of Post Falls, presenting the Livingston Annexation Case File ANNX 5 2020. The owner is Brian Livingston. The applicant is Tiffany Espy from ATS. Also representing um, and participating with the applicant is Todd Whipple and Lance Douglas. I do want to make it known that I don't know how they want to address when it comes to their uh, representation um, and conclusion of the staff report. So they may be able to enlighten us on that at that time. But their request is to for an approval to annex approximately 10 acres into the city of Post Falls with the zoning designation of high density multifamily R3. The project location is as you see here, it's on the northwest corner of Early Dawn and Zoros Road. <clears throat> to the east, you got the Foxtail subdivision that's developing. South of this red highlighted patch box, you do got the Bluegrass Apartments that's being developed. With this site here, um, proposing to be an R3 zone similar to Bluegrass to the south. The water provider would be the Ross Point Water District with the City of Post Falls providing sewer. This uh, proposal did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission on December 8th. It was a split vote and it was for that request of the multifamily. The PNZ was just reviewing the zoning aspect of it, not the annexation aspect. The split vote dealt with the proposed R3 and their main concern dealt with the timing of some of the Highway 41 improvements and some of the controlled intersections. Staff did modify uh, for this public hearing aspect of it the, and did uh, add a slide that discussed in more detail a lot about the transportation network and the timing of some improvements. So looking at this site, this is in the Foxtail a subdivision just east of Zoros Road looking west. You see off to the distance the undeveloped portions and you can start seeing these mounds of dirt where the bluegrass apartments have begun their construction. Here's the zoomed in intersection of Zoros and Early Dawn. To the south of what you see this yellow road which would be the extension of Early Dawn toward westerly towards Highway 41 and in south you see that site where the bluegrass apartments are being constructed and in the undeveloped portions on the north side of uh, potential future early dawn well it will be the early dawn road extension so looking at the zone change criteria you're looking at is it consistent with the future land use map consistent with the goals and policies found in the comprehensive plan which i won't go into all of that in this presentation but they are found in the uh, staff report but I will highlight some aspects. Zoning, looking at, is it uh, consistent with the street classifications and traffic patterns, existing development, future land uses, community plans, geographic or natural features? For as far as the geographic and natural features and community plans, there's really no specific plan other than there is the Highway 41 corridor plan and none of the proposed uses counter that, uh, that plan. I do though, 
want to hit these street classification and traffic patterns first year since that was the concern and have is, has been. So Rob Paulus, I don't know if you want to speak at this time regarding this slide. Yes, thank you, John. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, Robert Paulus, Assistant City Engineer. Uh, before you have an image that shows the road patterns in the area, uh, it's been color coded to kind of just identify where things are at in today's standard. The green roads are existing roads that are in place. The orange are roads that have either been approved for construction or are in the pr process of being constructed. And then purple is predominantly uh, what's being done with the Highway 41 widening project. It's also some blue in there, which are future roadways, which are anticipated, but there are no plans currently with development having um, projects to the city to get those built. The site itself does have access to State Highway 41 via uh, Early Dawn Avenue. Um, right now, bluegrass is built from the project's western site to Highway 41, and then the short piece between the project's eastern and western boundaries, which would connect to Zoros Road on the east, is under construction with the Bluegrass Apartments. We anticipate though, those improvements of that short piece of early dawn to be completed sometime in spring of 2021 or the summer of 2021 at the latest. Um, from the site, there's also an existing roadway that goes Zoros Road along its eastern boundary down to Pole Line Avenue and allowing the area to access signalized Highway 41 on Pole Line, or they can head e easterly along Pole Line to access other roads, providing access to Prairie Avenue or Hutter Road. Highway 41 itself as has been mentioned several times and was actually part of the concern was where they were at with construction. The project was bid, the award was provided to a contractor to start construction in the spring of 2021 within the next couple months when weather allows. A pre-construction meeting and a schedule of the contractor has not been provided yet. Um, when that is done, the city will be invited to that meeting as well. The anticipation and how Highway 41 was designed was with the new two northbound lanes being built in the summer of 2021. And along with that would be the side road improvements at uh, Pole Line Avenue, Prairie Avenue, and some of the other smaller roadways. In Pole Line Avenue in particular, that <clears throat> means improvements east of Highway 41 almost a quarter mile to the east, which is where Zoros Road is at. Then in 2022, ITD would be transferring traffic from the existing road lanes onto the new ones that they built and then rebuild the southern lanes and then complete any traffic signal modifications. Uh, that's a lot of material, but um, a, a quick overview of where things are at and how that site could be accessed by our, our existing road system. Are there any questions of council while I'm covering this material? Thanks, Rob. Any questions for Rob? I, I have one for Rob. Go ahead, Steve. Now, the uh, early dawn when it hits 41, is that, are you going to be able to cross 41 completely or will that just be, uh, say, a right-hand turn up the to the light? The early dawn intersection, along with any intersection in between the traffic signals, such as Hope and Pole Line, are going to be three quarter turn restricted. That means traffic on Highway 41 will be able to make turns onto early dawn Avenue and either a left turn or a right turn. But traffic on early dawn itself will only be able to make a, a right turn onto Highway 41. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. I Lynn, have a question. Lynn, for go Rob. ahead. One sec, Carrie. Lynn. Rob, is uh, early dawn paved all the way across? In the image, you see where the orange is yellow color. Right. That section is not paved, but the Bluegrass Apartments is in the process of building that section. And we anticipate that to be done sometime um, before the middle of the summer of 2021. Okay. So from the existing site we're, that we're talking about out to Highway 41, that's already exist paved, right? That is already existing paved, if that is correct. Okay, thank you. Carrie. My question is the blue 
uh, future roadway going up to Hope Avenue, then uh, turning west to the signal that it, that just says future roadway. Any idea when that would be completed? That would be done concurrent with future development. We do not know from Arcatero who's doing the Foxtail subdivision to the east when their next phase is going to happen in that area of Zop Zoros and Hope. Right now they have started to do a little bit more concentration to the east where you see Meyer Road and the orange line over in that area. Additionally, you have that approximately 10 plus acres between Zoros and Highway 41. There is no development on there at this time. However, it's reasonable to anticipate sometime um, five to seven years out from now that that would most likely be developed because that is a larger piece of land at a signalized intersection and being on the um, south side of a or on the side of the intersection where the heavier traffic volumes are going to be during the peak hours is usually fairly attractive to commercial development and becomes a little bit more desirable. But again, we do not have any anticipated time frame as to when those would occur. When, to clarify where that blue is that I was talking about, yep. it says a future roadway. Is there anything now, is there a dirt road? That right now is a dirt road and it is utilized more for um, access to a church that's at the proposed future signal. And then there's a couple of single family residences that utilize that as well. Thank you. No question. Oh. Rob, have we had any delays since the uh, first announcement that they were going to do work on Highway 41? It seems like we've had at least one delay but if we had i mean i guess that's my concern is what if this there gets were, delayed there were several delays um through last year because of right-of-way acquisitions itd has gotten through the portion of right-of-way acquisition and they um, did go out to bid and they did award the bid with construction to start uh, this spring so at this point in my discussions with ITD, I do not anticipate any further delays in moving into construction. And once construction starts, things should move pretty much according to their schedule with a two year uh, completion window. Two years, okay. Thank you. Thanks Rob. You're welcome. <clears throat> Mr. Manley, you have the Second, other parts of that other, that third criteria, the meaty criteria in this uh, review is looking at the future land uses and existing zoning aspects. So you're looking at Highway 41 on both sides, you see that red, that's that community commercial services, the uh, commercial zone. And the proposal is to um, be R3 within that quadrant that's, it's not unusual to see a transition in uses from a single family subdivision to a commercial with some multifamily at that transition that adds some built environment buffer. Many aspects, that's why the SUP south of this on the early dawn went with some apartments south there is providing that built environment transitional area with multifamily to Highway 41. Looking at the future land use map, what you see here in the pink is the business commercial designation. The descriptors on that, as you can see here, business commercial, it talks about uh, providing that mixture of moderate and higher housing types within walking distance of a city center, neighborhood center, or corridor commercial. The Highway 41 would be more considered that corridor commercial. It goes on and supports that mixture of housing types, even goes on to say that at least eight units per acre. Typical multifamily is almost always over 10, so it would meet that aspect of it. And you can see here that R3 is an implementing zone for that business commercial. Also, what you see here in the black areas within this, these are county islands. It's our comp plan has identified uh, county pockets as being 
important to bring in, not leave county pockets within the city of Post <coughs> Falls. Looking at the other three criteria, commercial and high density residential zones along streets with higher road classifications, um, you get right near Highway 41 and uh, Zoros and Early Dawn are collectors. You have limited in neighborhood commercial and lower density is typically a further away. So this really wouldn't be uh, further away. So having low dense de residential development of this would, would not be consistent with that criteria. And they're not asking for industrial. So that really wouldn't be applicable either, nor is it uh, an implementing zone. Did want to provide some housing data with this proposal, looking at uh, a percentage of the community that is multifamily. Uh, in 2019, looks like you're about close to 25% of the city was multifamily. And in, in 2020, it increased to close to 28% of the city. So that was a 3% gain between those two cities. But with that, the vacancy rates, even though we've seen uh, significant permits being issued for multifamily housing units, at this point in time, we haven't seen any, any indicators that the vacancy rates is being affected. So the demand for them continues to be extremely high. Also on that, when you look at the median household income in proportion to the median house values, because you're looking at, okay, what's the house going for? Why are people in multifamily? Is there a nexus? There potentially could be. You see that the median household income has gone up since 2010 at about 18%, with the median house value going up to about 80%. Also notice that the 2020 data, we don't have at this point in time. <clears throat> I looked at, um, I got the link down here to the source, but it was trying to understand the a mixture of multifamily to single family. Looks like in um, in this report here that the gain in 2018 was that the renter population exceeded 100 million at 108.5 million from 99.4 in 2010. Also showed that the number of renters have increased two times faster than the number of home homeowners. You see here climbing at the 9.1 to the 4.3. An interesting fact too that I wanted to cite was a lot of times uh, multifamily gets predispositioned as being um, low income, but it ends up actually being an increasing uh, desire for um, some wealthier individuals. Here we're cited that people that earn more than 150,000 per year has increased two times faster than the number of high earning homeowners at 156% to 78 respectively. So multifamily is this sector that uh, continuing to increase as a option, a, a choice that people are choosing to do over home ownership. I understand here that <clears throat> these are all major cities, but it's difficult for a big city to make big gains in any sector because it's there's so many housing choices or commercial choices, but you can see here that the renters share in some of these large cities had some significant gains in their cities from in the renters share of the markets. Many cities are actually getting and switching to where there's more renters than there are homeowners. Not saying that that's a goal, just citing some facts. <clears throat> Here's the agencies that were routed with this proposal. We did hear that the Kootenai County uh, approved as applied and that the Post Falls Police Department remained neutral on the proposal. So do you have any questions for me at this point in time? Thanks, John. Any questions proposed, for John? Uh, oh, uh, John, this proposed uh, project could max out at about 230 units. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be 10, closely that, yeah. Okay. I mean, that was the number that I, I think I pulled it out of the uh, planning and zoning meeting. Yeah, they'd have to max out their density bonuses or show how they were meeting uh, the bonuses, but yeah. 
And then bluegrass is about 300 units? Yeah, just south of this. Yeah, that's, yeah, 300 or so, yeah. And how much more, I can't, is that uh, foxtail, the yellow? Yeah, how much more development is there already approved and planned in foxtail? So foxtail, they've actually modified, I'll see if I can find a picture I don't really know it's probably best for now but what they've done is they've applied and through a series of minor amendments they've dissolved all of their multifamily units into smaller single family detached units that are going to be going to the east of the school a lot of the housing units are going to be what would be that missing middle type housing sector on some smaller as it transitions to some larger so everything east of Benicus would be a single family product. I do know that there's been discussions. They are looking at how are they going to transition from Hope Avenue to Prairie. They do, they do know that Prairie Avenue is going to be a busy road. They do know that there may be some commercial opportunities along Prairie. What kind of uses in that transition? No different than the discussion we've had tonight about transitioning from Zoros to 41 having some higher dense type product and what that looks like, they're looking at coming in with a potential amendment of which then would be a major amendment to a PUD, which then would go before you as a body and you would see what that looked like. I guess what I'm trying to get to is if the Livingston annexation comes in at 230 units, bluegrass is already 300 units, plus whatever we could add to foxtail i'm just really concerned that's going to put a heck of a burden on our road system as it exists today yeah when we went through the TAS analysis with the transportation zones <clears throat> there was a significant amount of population that was sent out i don't have the top of the, the numbers off the top of my head i apologize for that but <clears throat> There was a plan in that to meet the needs of the future growth, and it was along this corridor. Okay. Any other questions for John? Okay. I got one. It's, it's along the same line of, of Allen's, and I've asked this before whenever multifamily along or near Highway 41 comes up but what number of housing units of any type has already been approved and yet to be constructed and occupied along highway 41 do you know roughly off the top of your head i know i just put you on the spot well if you don't mind i mean i could look up real quick the taz on map that could show exactly what we're planning for as far as the population base up and down the highway 41 corridor yeah, is that a theoretical or is that an actual okay that we've approved the zoning and has yet to be built out that is a number that um, they asked by me looking at all, basically what we did is went through an exercise, we pulled up all the master plans and PUDs, and we had densities to that, and then we looked at the fact that the city of Post Falls planning was to get to about 105,000 by 2040. Not that the city of Post Falls was desiring that, growth was going to impose that demand on the city of Post Falls. Therefore, we put the densities out there, and I believe there's about 35,000, about 17,000 on both sides of Highway 41 as a population base, right on the, the note of um, Prairie and 41. Okay. So do, do you want me to pull up that TASMAP? Would that help? No, that's that's okay. Okay. One more question. Go ahead, Steve. 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 I've got Hang on one sec, Steve. Okay. John, I'm not a professional planner, but when you sit down and look at planning out the city and there's that area between Highway 41 and Zoros that's on the future uh, plan as commercial, I mean, as a planner, were you thinking that that would be housing or were you thinking that would be Business. businesses? Because I, I guess I'm... I know that that uh, multifamily is considered commercial development, but I guess uh, when I look at the map, I'm thinking that that red should be businesses, you know, 
strip malls, whatever, and not necessarily housing. Well, some of this philosophy, I mean, is going on for some time, but I believe that's the stem of why we have a special use permit for commercial. So you don't really, you know that there's going to be commercial type uses up the Highway 41, and it's been red my duration here, which has now been that since 2007. The saving grace of that theory a little bit, right, wrong, or indifferent, is the SUP process saying we don't have to go in here and throw in orange lines and make exact um, projections down the road because we have avenues for multifamily. They could ask for it outright through zoning or get it through a special use permit. And to me, that's, I believe, the philosophical approach of Highway 41. Okay. Steve. I, I think my question, I kind of have two questions. One of them was kind of long house thinking with the improvements to Highway 41 to make it easier for transportation. Wouldn't that spur a little bit more commercial along that corridor? Um, I apologize. Can you please re, re ask well, me? With the improvements to Highway 41, which makes it easier for cars to navigate and citizens, wouldn't that spur more interest in commercial development a little bit farther back of along Highway 41 and then farther back of Highway 41? Potentially, but what that's why in the, the updated transportation master plan and through the con re most recent comp plan amendment, Post Falls, we acknowledge that the eighth mile backage road would be a good backage road. It's something that Highway 95 doesn't have because that's about the max distance you're gonna get that uh, commercial, that the quarter mile, which is where you see Zoros, that you're going a little, bit at, a little bit far at that point in time, you lose some of that commercial energy and access onto the highway. So where you really have that eighth mile backage road, ideally would be right somewhere around this location here at 41 with commercial to the west. And maybe on Hope, you would end up with some commercial and but you would at your nodes get see some spill off of commercial down those those higher classified roadways but it would not be uncommon to see multifamily along this quadrant between the eighth mile and the quarter mile okay and i guess my second question would be best case scenario say if this was approved tonight uh when would they be able what would be the soonest time they would be able getting their permits in getting permission get everything in that they would be able to break ground for construction on that site? Would it be a year away, two years away? As soon as I could see is if it was annexed and, and you have the construction plans would be fall of this year with a spring at 2021 CO, the soonest. Okay. The, the applicant's representative may be able to give you what their time, but that's to me because you'd have your annexations, you would go and get through your construction plan documents to be reviewed over most of the summer, and you'd be looking at a late August, September start on construction. Okay, thank you. Linda has a question. Linda, go ahead. Um, John, excuse me, just to clarify what you just said, did you just say? that uh, the buildings would have a certificate of occupancy in 2021? Is that what you said? I was attempting to answer the inquiry of the soonest possible request for a CO. And to me, it seems like would be sometime early spring 2021 would be a very aggressive- 22? Uh, 2022. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, because I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I okay. still can't believe it's 2021, even though I'm glad 2020 is behind us. Okay, and then um, just one more thing, if I might. Um, you know, to, to what Al was saying, um, I understand that um, it would be really, really nice to have all that red be commercial and have a really bustling Highway 41 corridor. However, those are large parcels of land, and um, if we could talk a little bit more about what you were talking about right here, um, it looks like just to the west of this parcel where it would be a good idea for a backage road because I thought that was the plan all along, John. Um, you know, and and in when 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 we do development, do we not normally do 
Um, larger lots, R1, and then we just don't go from R1 and jump into, um, you know, like large commercial stores with, you know, trucks coming in at all hours of the night right up next to um, to R1 zoning. Is it is is that, it, would you say that's correct or? Yeah, I would say that's correct. I mean, you look at some of our goals and policies in the comp plan, you see a lot of it speaking to that. That's why you have that review criteria where you're trying to get your single family more removed from those urban, noisy, commercial or industrial areas. And then why there's multifamily policies that's, you know, you focuses on mobility and walkability and getting individuals closer to transit or their places of work. And so that's, Yes, so that would be a true statement. Any other questions? Thank you. Does the applicant wish to speak? Name for the record, please, and we've got a timer going for you. Hi, my name is Todd Whipple, and I thought maybe Tiffany was going to tie in there, and I was going to have Tiffany Espy go first. They're the primary applicant with ATS, and then I'll fill in after her if that's all right. Tiffany, are you there? Do we share the 15 minutes? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Tiffany Espy. I represent Brian Livingston with ATS uh, 9177 Hessen Hayden. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the staff for putting together such a great presentation, addressing a lot of the traffic issues that came up with the planning and zoning uh, commissioners last month. Um, as of right now, Brian doesn't have any plans for this property. He really just wanted to have options. So annexation uh, just made sense as far as getting those options. As you can see from the uh, current zoning map, everything around him is already incorporated into the city of Post Falls. So it just, it really makes sense to, to bring his piece into the city um, at this point. He did come to the city of Post Falls in January of 2020 and it was at that point he was asked to wait a year before applying for the annexation in order for that construction of highway 41 to at least be started um, they they did make him aware and us that it would likely be an issue as far as traffic concerns for that area um, regardless of what future development plans were going to take place on the property so uh, that does bring us to date. We did wait the year. Um, the R3 zoning was recommended at that time by the city planners. So, um, you know, he's been really flexible as far as, you know, he wants to bring his property into the city. It would be filling a very large, you know, hole in the city map right there, um, It which does coincide with their comprehensive policies of the city of Post Falls. Um, specifically states, you know, any county islands should be incorporated. Um, so it's a more cohesive infrastructure and everything uh, for development in that area. Um, as far as timing, you know, because he doesn't have anything proposed at this time, if he were to sell the property, um, he has had a, a few people come as potential buyers since that planning and zoning meeting, um, you know, like Mr. Manley stated, it is about two years, you know, of a process. If there were going to possibly be a subdivision on there, that's six to 12 months. If there was, you know, going to be construction plans approved after that point, there's another six to 12 months. Um, plus this annexation, if it were to be improved, my understanding wouldn't be finalized for several months um, as a starting point. So. I, I hope that timing issue has been addressed as far as possible uh, traffic con concerns in the area. Um, as far as Brian Livingston is concerned, he, he doesn't have any plans. He just wanted options for plans, which the county zoning did not give him. So um, I hope that addresses anything. I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. Any questions for Tiffany at this point? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Whipple. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Todd Whipple, and I'm with Whipple Consulting Engineers. And we were asked after the Planning Commission meeting to review the YouTube video and 
provide some supplemental information. When I watched the YouTube video, there was a lot of conversation about Highway 41, the timing, maybe what some of the improvements were going to be, what some of the other issues associated with development of that parcel would be. And so <clears throat> what we did, and as a part of your packet, we wrote two letters. Uh, one letter <clears throat> was really a timing issue. It was an access issue and was also to bring uh, city council up to speed on what the Highway 41 improvements were. I think Rob's uh, exhibit that he put up was excellent. Um, <clears throat> I think Rob kind of got caught off guard with the questions. He did a great job answering. I thought he answered uh, planning commission appropriately. I think there was just questions that maybe um, he couldn't answer. So <clears throat> what we did is we went through and did a trip generation and uh, a trip generation distribution letter to kind of uh, highlight uh, what you could expect from an apartment project. So I, we talked about 230. We did it without any bonus density, just at 180. And if you look at the letter that we wrote, you'll find that um, the uh, at 100 and, at 180, there's 35 a.m. peak hour trips that are <coughs> generated, and there are uh, 80 p.m. peak hour trips generated. And I want to put that into perspective. Um, commercial big box commercial, small box commercial, it generates about four p.m. peak hour trips per thousand square feet of building space. That means you subtract warehouse and you subtract those kinds of things. And so uh, 180 units of apartments in the evening only generates the equivalent of about 20,000 square feet of commercial. So to answer your question, if you were to fill your red up, you would probably generate somewhere between 15 and 20,000 additional p.m. peak hour trips entire your entire corridor along Highway 41. Whether that would fill up 41 or not, I don't really know. It's a lot of commercial. I've been doing this a long time. Over the years, I've worked on almost 40 million square feet of commercial, and I will tell you, commercial, when you talk to the majors, they want to know commercial rooftop. Commercial follows rooftops, not rooftops follow commercial. And so when commercial developers look at a piece of property, they draw circles, and they start counting count houses, and they start counting units. And they need so many units to be able to bring uh, major commercial endeavor into that area. <clears throat> and to give you an example, in Spokane, I know it doesn't really matter here in Post Falls, but the same is true. There won't be another grocery store built on the South Hill because there's already an Albertsons, because you can't draw the circle and get enough houses in that circle when you share it with Albertsons to get, another, to get a second grocery store. So commercial, as it relates to the red that you show on your map, really follows rooftops and not the other way around. And so <clears throat> I think it's important to understand that I think, um, I think John in your backage road, and I think in what we wrote up, sums it up succinctly, which is ideally you would go from single family residential and those people wouldn't want to come get into their car on Zoros and look across the street at the back of a Walmart, let's say, in their truck dock and their trash compactor. It's more appropriate for a single family residential, which we want to kind of cherish to have multifamily and then have multifamily be across the backage road from commercial. There's a lot of density. They can walk back and forth to commercial. So as it relates to the opportunity to transition, you would always try to go single family, some kind of mixed use multifamily option, and then your commercial. <clears throat> and I also then wanted to kind of now try to I got in late. I apologize. We you know Lance is I think in wants to pursue this piece of property. It goes well with his um, bluegrass project across the street, and I think it's important on timing to understand how that would work. If <clears throat> we wouldn't start development on this piece of property until bluegrass was already starting to be occupied. Bluegrass won't be occupied till sometime in summer of 2021, and there's 13 buildings in bluegrass. So construction on the Livingston parcel as it relates to apartments, if it was the extension of bluegrass, wouldn't really start until 2022 20, and go uh, with occupancy late 2022 up till 2023. And so in the documentation that we provided, I think it's consistent with what Rob said. We showed you our little diagrams. They were pink and blue. Pink was phase one, which was the east side, and blue was phase two, which was the west side. And they're going to complete the east side first, which means all the connections on the east side of the road will be done and complete with construction sequencing occurring all along the route as they continue to complete. So as it relates to development on this parcel, it's highly unlikely in any regard that this parcel will uh, occupy before Highway 41 would ever be complete. Um, <clears throat> and so 
the other uh, thing that I wanted to talk about that was brought up, and I'm kind of I'm kind of confused about it. I thought I thought John did a, a, re a really good job. Was it? I think the most important thing to think about when you consider uh, multifamily, multifamily is market driven. If vacancy rates were at 11%, you probably wouldn't get any multifamily applications. You know, you the, the concept that <clears throat> multifamily falls out of the sky, kind of like the Wicked Witch, that a building falls out of the sky, it takes a long time to develop multifamily. And so multifamily development has to precede what, where they believe the demand will be in two years or three years down the road. Single family is much more modifiable. In other words, you can have 10, 15, 20 houses start in. If the market changes, you can stop. But once you start an apartment project, it's pretty hard to stop once you're in framing. So it's kind of one of those things that you complete. So right now, demand is high. I think um, it's a, what we've seen in the industry, and I, and I think the people who are experts in it more than I know it from the engineering side, is that <clears throat> the millennials don't seem to be wanting to buy houses as frequently as the previous generations. They much prefer their time. In other words, they would rather work hard and take time off and not necessarily maintain a yard, but go skiing, or take their time off and go backpacking, or take their time off and maybe walk their dog but not have a yard, because um, it's allowed in apartments. And so there's been kind of a shift in how people, in how people um, buy homes, move back and forth from apartments, which I think is why the metric that John showed about there's people with higher incomes moving into apartments simply because they don't want to mow the lawn on Saturday. They'd rather go out on the lake or go, go camping or do something different. So um, I, I think from what we heard at Planning Commission, and hopefully it's been, it's been answered, I, 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 uh, is that Transportation is less for multifamily than it is for commercial by, by just a huge number. Um, the number of trips that will be generated by um, the development of this property as multifamily is considerably less. A 10-acre parcel for commercial, back in the day when we were doing major commercial, it wouldn't be inconceivable to put a big box on 10 or 12 acres. Well, that would be a 145,000 square foot store. And that 145,000 square foot store would generate 1,400 p.m. peak hour trips. It's a lot. It's a lot of trips in, 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 in a p.m. peak hour. Whereas an apartment complex on the same piece of property generates 80. So I'm hoping that that helps as you consider these kinds of things down the road, the way that traffic and transportation works. Commercial follows rooftops. You have to have lots of rooftops to develop commercial. Once you get your rooftops, you'll get your commercial. And then Commercial is more cost-centric cost and tends to get overbuilt real quick. And so you'll drive by brand-new strip centers where they've got a tenant, and then there's nothing else. So um, it's, it's changed. And offices change, too, and nobody knows where office is going with COVID. Um, we have city council members here, and they're this right here. I, can't tell, I came down here tonight because I can't tell you how tired I am of Zoom, WebEx, and Microsoft team meetings. I have done two or 300 hearings before, and it was nice to be able to come down and get out of the office. But I will tell you, I have learned, you can be, I think, like John was, you can be very effective sitting at your desk, doing your meeting, just take your mouse, go to your exhibits, and scroll through them. So um, I'm not so sure if, if I have anything else right now. I think, I think our, our submittal, hopefully it, it helped you answer some questions, and we had lots of exhibits in there about the kind of intersections you were getting, what the trip generation is going to be. Um, you know, we ask that you approve the R3. We think that it's an appropriate use. We think that as the city and John does more planning, I think you'll find that between the backage road and the single family, the R1 stuff, that maybe R3 is an appropriate use up and down the corridor. Um, that will supplement and really help, I think, the commercial, the red that you have on your map. Um, and if that, I'll ask you if you have any questions. Questions, Mr. Whipple, at this point? See none. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Shannon, anyone wishing to testify in favor? We have none in favor. Any neutral? We have none neutral. Any opposed? We have one. Hold on. Bob, can you unmute yourself? I can hear you. Go ahead. Bob, uh, name for the record, please, and you got four minutes, Bob. Bob Flowers. 
Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I won't address the same thing that we all know, because we've heard this rooftops generate commercial for years. I'm still waiting for the commercial to show up because we've definitely got the rooftops. What I'm trying to address tonight is the safety. And I believe that there's nothing more important than the safety of the citizens of Post Falls. As most of you know, 41 is insane now. And during the construction period, it's going to be even worse. What I'm basically here to ask you to do tonight is to uh, put off this project until we get 41 completed and actually see where we're at. I have no idea how many projects have already been approved along Highway 41, but there's been quite a few. I'd like to know the total number actually. But to approve another 500 cars to get dropped onto 41 right now, I believe is, it, it's crazy. It's, uh, it's not safe out there right now. And you're putting, if you approve this, you will be putting people's lives in danger because it's not safe on 41 and it won't be until at least until they're done. And then maybe we would actually get a chance to take a look at this. But right now, I do not believe that putting another high density multifamily unit right next to Highway 41 is in the best interest of the city of Post Falls and its citizens. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Applicant care to rebut any comments you've heard. With that, I'll close the public hearing. Um, let me start with a comment, a couple comments. I usually don't get to vote, so I'll make my comments. Mr. Flowers mentioned, and I will go back to the same thing. Mr. Whipple, I know you've done this for a long time and I've, your numbers have been good, but you mentioned the you need to have rooftops for commercial. I've been involved with the city for 27 years, and from day one I've heard you need more rooftops. We have grown from probably just south of 10,000 to 43,000 people, and I'm hearing we don't have enough rooftops for businesses. So I know that that's a philosophy, but it, it's a hard one for me to swallow when I've seen what I've seen. Um, you talk about the low vacancy rate in apartments. Uh, I subscribe to the Build It and They Will Come theory. The reason we're seeing such a low vacancy rate is because we've got apartments and people are coming here. And is growth, uh, my question would be, is growth our goal? Do we want to be no, uh, known as multifamily capital of the uh, in the Northwest? Because I can't remember, but it seemed to me that we had, I wanted to say almost 1,500 units in different projects that were going in at this point. Uh, I am concerned with the number. Um, the... You you mentioned the transition. I understand the transition, single family, multifamily, commercial, but oftentimes we hear people don't want to uh, live in their home and look over at a loading dock or the back of a building. So we're going to put apartments in. Well, the people in the apartments are not going to be looking at the back of those buildings. So uh, one way or another, you're going to have residents looking at the backs of those buildings. So again, I, I followed your numbers in and uh, I. I no, you've done this for a long time, and I respect what you've done, but I do have some concerns with, with some of those issues. Um, with that, I will open it up to council for comments. Uh, Mr. Malloy, why don't you lead off? All right. Uh, I'm going to agree and piggyback on a lot of what you said. Uh, again, our population of, of residential has just ballooned here, and, and the commercial just hasn't followed at nearly the same rate. Uh, and I've been saying the same thing for the last couple of years. Uh, I haven't voted for a single multifamily annexation along the Highway 41 corridor or even Ross Point just south of it in the last two years, just because we've got the construction that's going to be going on for the next couple of years. And I really think we need to let that be completed 
and see where we are before you start before we keep adding to it. And, and since I've been voting that way, we've added to it substantially, uh, both north and south of I-90 and east and west of 41. Uh, you know, we're talking about an annexation here. And so, you know, Mr. Whipple, I agree with his uh, numbers that commercial does bring in more traffic than residential. However, since this is an annexation, we don't have to consider it either right now. We can just not annex it. And so that would leave the maximum at, you know, one house per five acres to so two houses on it. That doesn't add anything to the to the system in, in any case if we don't annex it now. And I'm just, we keep talking as a council about, you know, maintaining a small town feel and that's, that's deteriorating rapidly. And the more we just keep adding more and more multifamily on already congested roadways that can't handle it, uh, the worse that's gonna get. And it's a whole lot easier to get in front of growth for the infrastructure than to put the growth first and try to catch up the infrastructure later. I understand they're both going on simultaneously right now, but we really don't know where we're going to be in two years because there's still so much to be built out that's already been approved. So uh, I'm going to not support this annexation regardless of what the zoning is. Thank you, Joe. Mr. Wolf. Uh, I would agree with the mayor and with uh, Mr. Malloy in regards to growth. I don't know that we need to grow that much right now, but that's my minor concern. My major concern is the traffic and the access to this property. And I know that we asked these folks a year ago to put it off a year and wouldn't you know, Highway 41 got delayed a year. So if we would have approved this last year, we'd be really in a pickle. And that's why I asked Rob about further delays. Well, even if we don't have further delays, we could see this property develop in a year. And we're not gonna see the roads done for at least two years. So that goes back to the safety issue and the traffic issue. So number one, I'm not thrilled about adding more to the city. We don't need to grow right now. We've got enough <clears throat> vacant land and where people can build apartments and houses or whatever. That's number one. But number two, the biggest one is the, uh, the access and the transportation. So I would not be in favor of this either. Thank you. Mr. Borders. I got to support uh, my fellow counselors in the same regard. Uh, I think we still have some infrastructure improvements that need to be made before we can do something of this nature. Traffic is a big concern for me. Um, timing, I think, is more of the issue than anything. Um, I think we're just premature with all of the construction that's to happen in the next couple of years. So I wouldn't support doing that at this time. Thank you. Ms. Council President Wilhelm. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to agree with the rest of the city councilors on this project as well. And um, also, uh, nice to hear you, Bob Flowers. We haven't seen you for a while. I'm going to agree with Bob Flowers on this too. And usually he and I don't agree too much on things, but um, the safety issue um, and the congestion, even out there right now on Highway 41, I think putting anything else out there right now prior to that highway being finished and then having another look at it is in, um, in the best interest of the citizens of Post Falls. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thor Thorson. Well, on the plus side, uh, the, the benefit would be getting a county pocket into the city. The transition from the single family to multifamily to commercial you know, checks all the boxes, but it is, it, it's just a little, a little premature without the signals, without, yeah, uh, it, it would be impossible for me to support it at this point, but other than the traffic, it checks all the boxes and um, would be a good project at that location, but thank not today. You. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. 
I, I think Mr. Uh, Livingston and the staff, they did everything right. They, they did check all the boxes on it. But again, to me, it's like the other council members. It's just uh, an issue of timing. And I think the other project we might have put off a year ago was maybe a little bit south of this. But to me, they're still the same. We're still in the same situation we were a year ago. So um, I would be against this annexation at this time also. I just think uh, in Joe's words, we maybe just need to step back and take a breath and see where we're at uh, in a year from now. Thanks, Steve. I'd entertain a motion. I would move to deny the Livingston annexation ANNX 005-2020. Second. second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item up tonight is unfinished business returning ordinances, and we do have two ordinances tonight. The first would be the Jacobs Run vacation. I move to place the ordinance Jacobs Run vacation file number VACA 006 2020 on its first and only reading while under suspension of the rules. Second. Okay. Motion second. Further discussion? Shannon, please take the roll. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Wilson. An ordinance of the City of Post Falls, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, providing for the vacation of an easement situated on the northeast corner of North Greensbury Road and East Bogey Drive within lots one and two of block one within Jacobs Run subdivision in the city of Post Falls as described herein, providing for disposition of vacated easement, providing repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing severability, providing an effective date, and providing for other matters properly relating thereto. Move to approve the ordinance, Jacobs Run va vacation file number VACA-006-2020, to ask the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next up is the ordinance on the North Place right of way vacation. Okay, I'll do it again. I would move to place the ordinance uh, North Place right of way vacation file number VACA 004 2020 on its first and only reading while under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Wilson? An ordinance of the City of Post Falls, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, providing for the vacation of a 20 foot right of way situated east of North Idaho Street, west of Greens Ferry Road, north of the Fieldstone subdivision in the City of Post Falls, as described herein, providing for disposition of the vacated right of way, providing repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing severability, providing an effective date, and providing for other matters properly relating thereto. Move to approve the ordinance, North Place right of way vacation file number VACA 004 2020 to ask the clerk to assign the appropriate number and let it be published by summary only. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda tonight is new business, and we have three items. First is resolution for pre-selection of consultants. We're going to have a presentation, or is that just the resolution? That's, I believe it's just a resolution. On. Just a resolution? I'd move to approve the resolution for pre-selection of consultants. Second. second. Motion second. 
Further discussion? Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> We have one more resolution, but the next item up is the authorization for the Public Works Department to purchase budgeted fiscal year 21 vehicles. As you saw in the staff report, uh, I believe Mr. Beecham presented that these were vehicles that were approved in the budget. Yes. Uh, we have a time constraint coming forward. Uh, John, is that uh, summarize it enough or do you care to add comment? Uh, I think that summarizes it pretty well. Any questions on that issue? Is that an entertain a motion? Uh, let's see. I've moved to approve the authorization for the Public Works Department to purchase the budgeted fiscal year 21 vehicles. Second. I can. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. John, I wasn't trying to steal your thunder, but you did such a good job in your report. I thought it was fairly simple. So, Last item under uh, new business and action items is resolution uh, adopting a policy to provide process. I have moved to approve the resolution adopting policy to provide process for receiving, evaluating, and issuing proclamations. Second. second. Motion second for the discussion. Roll call, please. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes, and I would like to thank you on that one. We get requests for proclamations all the time, and it's just unbelievable. So I, I appreciate now we have a policy in place to deal with it. How was that? Actually shocked we didn't have one, so I was happy to see it. Yeah. Administrator staff reports. We have none tonight, sir. Citizens issues. Shannon, anyone wishing to testify? We have none. Mayor or Council. I'm sorry. Please. And I know you did before, but name for the record, please. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Todd Whipple again, and uh, I was kind of waiting for open mic night. Um, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, and I'm, and I'm hoping that Rob and Bill, who I, I know are listening, can um, get a presentation from Kootenai County uh, Council of Governments to come talk to you about the rooftop versus housing thing. I, 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 threw, an, I threw a number out, and I'm not so sure because I live, you know, I've been doing traffic engineering my whole life and just re engineering as well as everything else, you know, land of it, the subdivision stuff. The first 10 years of my career, I was all, I built highways, designed highways. And after that, I, last 30 years has been all development. But a part of that traffic has kind of been, you know, my, my specialty. There's two things as an engineer, you're supposed to specialize in something. Mine's drainage and traffic. They're kind of related. They're all based on watersheds. So when, when I was talking about the rooftops and the, in the, in the, in the and the comparison between single family, multifamily, and commercial. I, I, made, a, I made a comment that uh, a 145,000 square foot box would generate 1,400 p.m. peak hour trips. And those 1,400 p.m. peak hour trips are about 50-50 or 60-40 in and out. That's every day, including probably more trips on Saturday and less trips on Sunday. And the point that I want you to consider about why rooftops, a commercial follows rooftop is, if I have 1,400 p.m. peak hour trips, basically seven days a week, that's 10,000 trips to one decent sized store a week. And we all kind of shop maybe one day a week, maybe two. So if you assume single family generates one p.m. peak hour trip, that's a recognized value. Mostly it's in, you know, it's 80% in, 70% in, 30% out. That means you need 10,000 houses, or if you cut them in half, say 5,000 houses for 145,000 square foot or 145,000 square feet of commercial. So what happens is you need to put on five to 7,000 units 
to, to provide enough rooftops for these commercial endeavors to want to bring something to your community. And so they do. I've sat in meetings. There was a time when Home Depot, Walmart, Target, and Shopco were our primary clients. And I've sat in boardrooms in Bentonville and Cabela's in Kearney, Nebraska. And I've seen them draw these Venn diagrams. And, you know, Cabela's draws it around three states. They're trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to get people. But the reality is, is don't diminish how many rooftops it takes to keep business, commercial enterprises, in business. And so I, I know that you are not the only city. I have stood, now basically not standing, you know, Zoom, WebEx, and <laughs> Microsoft Teams in front of city councils across the board. Everybody's tired of apartments. It's not just you. It's Coeur d'Alene. It's Post Falls. It's Liberty Lake, City of Spokane Valley, City of Spokane, Spokane County. Every jurisdiction is tired of them. But the, the reality is, is houses at, the mo you know, when, when John put up his thing at $389,000 for a single family house, do you know houses in Idaho now cost more than starter homes in Washington? I'm really not sure your land's cheaper. Your cost to develop your impact fees have something to do with it. So don't, I've done this for a living. We've done, you know, 15,000 or 17,000 single family units, 15,000 multifamily units and up to 40 million square feet of commercial development. It is really true that you have to have the trips from so many houses to go to these endeavors to shop. And with now with more online shopping, I don't know what that metric is going to do. You're going to find on your map, and I'm, I don't know, I don't want to get John in trouble. It's your map. Um, I look at maps all the time. You have too much red. And I don't mean that to be facetious because we lost tonight because we'll, we'll come back with Mr. Livington hopefully in a year and we'll have this conversation again. But how rooftops, if you look at all the red that you have, I did a traffic study once that looked how many trips the vision would generate based on all its commercials. A million PM peak hour trips, right? Well, there's not enough houses in Spokane, which is why you have so much commercial turnover. Somebody has a great idea, they open a business and it doesn't work because 11 people came in yesterday and they need 152. So please, as you move forward, don't be frustrated that commercial comes slowly. You do need rooftops. Uh, it's very serious. I think that you can bring people in. You can talk to King County Council of Government. You can figure out what kind of trips would be associated with my zero time ending. Good. Thank you. Anyway, uh, uh, please talk to them and have them explain to you how that works. And I'd be happy to come over and meet individually and kind of go through the process of how development is chosen and how it happens. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You bet. Mayor and Council comments. Uh, only one, only uh, comment I will have is that we're starting to see the vaccines coming in and vaccines going out. And uh, I know we spoke, Mayor Whitmire and I spoke with the governor and told him that we weren't pleased with the uh, efficiency and speed with which it was being handled. And uh, he assured us things were being done. I know Kootenai Health has stepped up. I know Northwest Specialty is uh, offering uh, their f facility. I know uh, I was talking with Shelly earlier. Uh, the fairgrounds is now a site where vaccines can be received. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to see the numbers, number of people eligible to receive the vaccines uh, increased at a, uh, the speed at which they're eligible increase faster than what it is right now. So, um, you know, I would love nothing better to be sitting here in the not too distant future in a regular meeting with everybody here and not having to worry about all the things we've worried about for the last year. So uh, hang in there. Yeah. It's coming, I hope, and, and we'll get through this. So council comments. I would just piggyback on that. And I know I sound like a broken record, but we're not done with this yet. And I still encourage everybody to wear their mask, to, to slow the spread. To do, do whatever they can so we can get back to normal as soon as possible. Yep. yep. With that, we do not need an executive session tonight. Is that correct? That is correct. So the next motion is? Move to approve. All those in favor? Adjourned. Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>